Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We like to do things on time. Welcome everyone this evening, this Wednesday evening, to our little webinar on international admissions trends with a little bit of testing. And importantly, we're going to focus in on the admissions trends and what's happening with an eye towards international students. So a lot of these webinars are going on now with information broadly, but this is going to be more specific for students who are international school, I guess probably Asia focused, but um, a little bit broadly about schools everywhere. My name is Jeremy Craig. I run a company here in Singapore called Test Acres, and what we do is mainly SAT preparation. I've been doing this here in Singapore for over 20 years. Uh, tonight, we're lucky enough to be joined by Trevor Sturgeon. Uh, Trevor owns a company called TS College Tours, and he, he's based in Manila, where he works at the International School Manila, and prior to that, he worked at the American School here, among other various international postings, so we're very lucky to have him on board. Um, just a quick kind of rules of engagement here. We're going to get through this as quickly as we can. The recording to this will be up on YouTube within 24 hours or so, and all of you will get a link to that recording to be able to look at it later on with timestamps. Um, we both talk kind of fast, so if you have any specific questions about as we go through, feel free to email us afterwards. We'd be more than happy to flesh out any answers that you might want to have along the way. Um, and any Q&A that we have, you can just put it in the Q&A box that's already open on Zoom. I'm not doing any polls or anything. Those are just waste time. So and we're just going to go ahead and get started now. So Trevor, anything to add as I arrange the slides here? No, welcome, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Jeremy said, along with having worked in international schools, I run a college tour company, which I'll chat a little bit about later on. So once again, welcome. Okay. Okay, here we go. I've been on testing. Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to cover today is a whirlwind tour of admissions trends and all the main destinations for students in Asia, except schools in Asia, um, mainly UK, Europe, Australia, with a particular focus in tapping Trevor's expertise to talk a lot about trends in America and also Canada. I'll just chime in a little bit on testing. There will be another testing webinar next Wednesday that hopefully some of you will come in on as well. We'll talk a little bit about, about recommendations rather by graduation year um, in terms of if you're junior, seniors, sophomore, et cetera. And then we'll just open it up to any Q&A that appears in the chat. And again, any other questions that you might have, just feel free to email in later on. Um, I've been saying this ever since COVID started, geez, what does it feel like 16, 17 years ago? But um, there's a great Chinese saying, which is called which means to walk across the river by feeling for stones. I've been saying that for the last three years. I think now the stones, people know where the stones are and people, as things are kind of coming together and that we know what's going on with international admissions and the, the whole, I don't want to say paradigm shift, that's overused, but the, 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 the landscape that, that young graduates are facing is profoundly different than it was five, 10 years ago. And a lot of people are still coming to grips with that and understanding that what you think it was for even an older sibling four years ago, is a very different experience that they have now. Broadly speaking, there's been a mass flight to quality where the most competitive schools have become much, much more competitive broadly. Um, but again, there are the other 98, 99% of universities out there that are quite keen to get good students. That said, there's all kinds of really bad information floating around there, fake news, uh, numerous different sources, be it, be it WhatsApp groups, be it, be it TikTok groups, be it Facebook pages. Um, and really the only way to get good information is either from your international school admissions university advisor people or from the actual school. Um, the school will release all this information on the school website or on their Twitter account. Don't really trust any third party information when getting information from, uh, from universities about requirements and deadlines and things like that. You, you might be fooled. Uh, Trevor, anything to add on that? I know it's good, Jeremy. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to talk broadly about the UK. Now, a slight proviso, obviously neither of us are British. So I, I had a good long chat with some friends of mine who are, know a lot about this stuff. And this is me distilling this information to four big points. Uh, like in the US, there's been a deferment wave where people who got in to start in 2019 might say, you know what, I want to start in 2020. Those who got in for 2020 might start in 2021. And that just continues on down the line. And that makes the number of seats for new applicants a little bit smaller. So that just makes the school harder to get into. Um, a lot of schools are over-enrolled and the UK system is very different. For those of you who don't understand UCAS and how all that works, certainly have a chat with your university advisor who knows a lot about the UK system. But it's very different 
from what we do in the States, simpler in a way. And what we're seeing is a lot of the most popular majors. So, so for example, if you want to study economics at uh, London School of Economics, that is really hard to get into, really, really hard to get into. But if you maybe want to study economics and math at LSE, that made that faculty, they call them, might be a little bit easier. So you have to be a little bit selective in terms of which faculties you apply to, because obviously you don't apply to the school in general like you do in the States or Canada, you apply to the specific faculty. So you have to be very mindful of that. And even the grade requirements, they're saying you needed this grade to get in. Some students still aren't just aren't getting in, even though they had that score that they thought was enough, that five years ago would have been enough. And of course, that's been partially caused and driven by the, the grade inflation that's become rife both with A, A levels in the, in the UK and also abroad, and also IB grades are sneaking up a little bit more and more every year. And again, when everyone scores a perfect score, then what does the score mean? Um, this is a problem that we, the US has been facing for many, many years, um, and it's, it's coming home to roost a little bit with the UK. Uh, Trevor, anything to add on that? No, I would just say the grade inflation thing especially um, is very obvious, you know, having worked in a and an IB school, and for the last two years, the IB essentially made accommodations for schools. Um, and for the first year of COVID, a lot of schools, most schools in the world, um, didn't actually have tests. So it allowed schools to essentially use their predicted um, grades along with a distribution of IB grades that the IB gave schools. So there has been a pretty substantial increase in IB grades from most schools around the world. Yeah, and, and what, what we've seen in America, there's been a lot of academic work on this, that grade inflation goes back to the 1960s when university professors didn't want their students to get drafted. And then the grades started sneaking up then. And it's, it's really easy for grades to go up. It's really, really hard for grades to come down again. Um, and, and all of a sudden, if you're giving a bunch of A's and then next year you start giving a bunch of B's, uh, that is very, very tricky to do. I know of no instances where that's gone smoothly. Okay, so anyway, on to Australia. I'm sorry, Europe rather. Okay, here we go. Um, Brexit is still shaking its way through, but that's sort of been clouded with COVID. The main, main, main story, like Japan and Korea and also Taiwan, Europe has too many universities. They built a bunch of them in the 1950s and 60s. And now as a bunch of universities are kind of clatter, clattering about looking for more students, obviously there are fewer, fewer Dutch and Germans than there were 20 years ago at that school going age. So they're opening up more for international students um, to some more degrees than others. Uh, the Netherlands has a lot of great university college kind of liberal artsy type programs that are wonderful, normally three years rather than four. Um, Ireland is obviously a great, a great destination, particularly if you have an EU passport. Um, and then Ireland, um, I'm sorry, Italy, Spain, and Belgium, Italy in particular and Spain have really great kind of niche programs in arts and business. Um, that are great deals if you're EU, but even if they're also wonderful deals, even if you're not EU, um, because their tuition is very obviously heavily subsidized by the government, and it's just a wonderful option to look at. Um, but, but look at their requirements very carefully. A lot of the more competitive programs, again, do require um, you, you to be in that top math cohort, be it AHL uh, math or, or A-level math, whatever the case may be. Um, and then for, for American system, I guess that it, you need to have calculus coming out of high school at the very least. Um, Trevor, anything out about Europe? No, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Europe's an excellent destination. Have a look. Australia, here we go. Australian universities were killed by COVID. Um, the way it happened, it, COVID started in March of 19, right when students were starting to go back to university. That's there on the different school year there. And that, that, that's, that torpedoed one or two years of their admissions. And before COVID, Australian universities were heavily dependent on foreign students to start with. And they really lost a lot of those students. They had online learning and stuff like that, but who wants to pay full fare for online? And they lost a lot of students. What we're hearing anecdotally is a lot of students are getting into to faculties at schools at wonderful Australian University. They didn't even think they would get into. So the faculty says, listen, stated on the website, you need to have this score to get in. And they come in three or four points lower and they're accepted. And happy days, everyone's a winner. So Australian universities, to a certain extent, they're almost like they haven't eaten in a while. They need to like catch up on their meals to get full for that full class size as well. Because under the previous government in Australia, they weren't getting a whole lot of money from the feds. So they had to make up for it, getting as many international students as possible. Um, to find out more about Australian universities, there's probably an Australian university rep within 100 meters of you right now. They're all over Southeast Asia and Asia. They have offices that are very aggressive in, um, in, in marketing themselves. 
I just read that university, uh, Western Australian state government, states there, uh, Western Australian state government is helping to pay agents to recruit for Western Australian universities. So they're getting a subsidy to pay agent fees, um, which is something that is would never, ever, ever happen in the States or the UK. So uh, that is basically Australia and New Zealand sort of similar, but fewer schools. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, Trevor, anything to add in Australia, New Zealand? No. Okay. All right, now we're over to Trevor on the really fun stuff, the, the hard assignment on what's going on in U.S. admissions and why they're so messed up. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I could talk for a, lo a long time about sort of the trends, but I think what we wanted to do is to highlight some of the biggest sort of trends that are happening right now in, in U.S. admissions. As many of you probably know, for the last couple of years, most U.S. universities have been test optional meaning that students did not have to submit SAT or ACT scores to be considered for admission. Most continue to remain test optional, um, the vast majority of four-year institutions at least, although there are some notable exceptions like, like MIT. Um, so that has really meant that students who before might not have applied because they knew they wouldn't be eligible or really seriously considered because of their test scores are now applying. So that's meant a really big jump um, to the most selective schools in terms of number of applications. At the same time, however, they're not increasing their enrollment um, at all. So that basically means admit, 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 admit rates at schools, um, at the highly selective schools um, are dropping. And even at the less, or, or still selective, but not the highly selective schools like Northeastern last year, had an astonishingly low admit rate, um, both for um, early decision, but especially for regular decision. The idea of deferment where, you know, students who got admitted during COVID decided to postpone for a year um, and, and go to school the next year has been for fewer spaces for, at some schools, for new applicants. And that was a case with Northeastern as well, which, was part of the cause of their low acceptance rate last year. Um, and for international students, they're even lower. Um, one big change that's happening in, in the US is in California, where the UCs are basically making a shift back to accepting more stateside students and fewer international students. So I believe I was reading something not too long ago that said the UCs collectively accepted 12% fewer international students last year. Now, 12% doesn't seem like a whole lot, that is thousands and thousands of international um, students. We'll go to the next slide, Jeremy, unless you have something to, to add here. So again, having lower test scores um, are no longer a barrier to entry. I think what a lot of counselors are saying at schools to students is take the SAT or the ACT. Um, the SAT is far more popular, at least in our region of the world. But to take the SAT, see how you do. And if your scores are competitive for the particular universities you're applying to, then go ahead and submit them. Um, and if not, um, just simply don't, don't submit them if the school is test, test optional. You know, one big benefit I mean, there's a lot of benefits for colleges to having more students apply. Number one is probably that it has a role in most college rankings. So if they accept fewer students, their ranking goes up. Um, but the other factor is they bring in a lot of money from application fees. And you'll see the numbers there for both NYU and USC in terms of how many millions of dollars they've brought in through applications. The other thing that we're hearing from college reps, um, in fact, just last weekend, I was at a conference where there was about 160 different university reps. So I had a chance to have conversations with many of them. And one big trend we're seeing is that they're getting more and more applications to, I guess, fewer programs. So STEM and business programs are by far the two most popular sort of intended majors for students from Asia. And I think what we're hearing from a lot of reps is they like STEM students, but they like STEM students with some humanities interest as well. Uh, we won't get into too much about, about rankings, um, 
but I would just caution you um, if you're interested in rankings, there's a whole bunch of different rankings sources out there. Um, and I would really investigate kind of how they, what factors they use in creating their, their rankings. And the other factor that I think a lot of counselors at international schools are advising, um, or the other thing that they're advising students to consider is look at schools off the beaten path. Um, I know that one school, international school in the region had over 50% of their, all their applications of about 1200 or so applications go to just 50 institutions. Um, and the other 50% go to almost 400 different institutions. So, you know, and, th and thinking about sort of competition to some degree, students are in competition or they're, they're being looked at in the same pool as their peers from their school and from that country. Um, and a school can be great and have the brightest kids in the world, but a place like Harvard, for example, um, is never gonna take 10 students from one international school. Anything to add, Jerry? On yeah, I, I just would echo that last point, Trevor. There, there's sort of X number of students both get in from a select international school in particular, and also X number of students might only be getting in from one particular country. Um, I remember I, I, I interviewed for Columbia University for a long time, and they never really told us that, but pretty much it was unofficial. We're going to accept X number from Singapore, uh, and that's basically it. So they, they accept X number knowing that a fraction of that are going to enroll, and that's all the room they have, they have room for. Because even um, you know, Columbia mid-sized big international university only have 12 or 1,300 undergrad spaces to fill. So if all of a sudden you take 30 kids from Malaysia, then that's a good chunk already done even if the kids are perfectly well qualified. So I, I've said for a long time, look where everyone else is applying and then, then maybe look at other schools. And I would just add to that, Jerry, and, and yeah. you know, for the super selective schools, um, the Ivy League pluses, um, although I hate saying Ivy League, uh, I think if you look back, back historically for Singapore, for example, um, for each of those institutions, it's always been under 10 students for the entire country of, of Singapore. I mean, that really hasn't changed much. Um, again, in, in the meantime, more and more students are applying, more and more families have the resources to fund their kids' education. So that's meaning acceptance, rate, acceptance rates are continuing to drop at those highly selected institutions. Yeah, and the institutions aren't getting any bigger. <laughs> okay, on, on to more trends. Well, a few more trends. Um, no one has a crystal ball, of course, but I think the popular belief, belief out there is that test optional will continue for a while. Um, I think it's gonna be difficult for universities to turn back and, and start requiring the SAT again. In conjunction with that, I would say that the student essays, both the Common App essay, if it's a common application school, and any supplemental essays are having are more and more important than ever. Because they no longer have the SAT or Quite honestly, if they have the SAT, they're really focusing a lot more on the student voice. Um, so the essays are really important for students to kind of knock out of the park. Legacy, so legacy refers to if a student who's applying, if their parents went to an institution at some institutions that used to have a role in admissions and it still does at some, but many universities or a few universities are pulling away from that and no longer considering um, alumni children. Instead, they're really focusing on wanting a more diverse incoming class. So underrepresented populations on the campus, both in terms of racially, ethnically, um, socioeconomically, they're looking for a greater diversity. So that's going to be a real challenge going forward for many families with students in international schools, not only in Asia, but around the world, because generally speaking, the students that attend these schools come from wealthy, highly educated backgrounds, which really these universities um, have already have lots of. The other thing we're hearing from missions um, from college um, admissions office is because of COVID and other factors, um, they're really being stretched in terms of their workload with the increase in applications, along with a lot of um, admissions reps resigning or moving on to different sort of career paths means that admissions reps are reading a lot more and I think they're reading a lot faster. I was talking to one university rep at this recent conference 
and they hire outside readers and the readers are expected to read 15 applications in an hour. So I think that works out to be like eight minutes each to read the kid's application, their essay, two teacher X, counselor recommendation, the student's essay, and try to make a decision. Um, a trend that's been happening for the last number of years is that more and more colleges are filling a greater percentage of their incoming classes through early decision. So early decision is that binding admissions um, where the kids can apply that essentially they're committing to attend a, a college or university if admitted and they can't apply anywhere else. Because they have the students sort of locked in, um, it's making it much easier for colleges sort of to predict outcomes and they're filling a smaller percentage of their classes through regular decision. And kind of connected to that, because it's become more difficult for colleges to predict yield or percentage of students that they accept will actually end up attending, they are creating more wait lists. So a wait list is when, you know, in May, once they realize that they are only 50 students, for example, fewer than they expect to suggest to them, then they'll go to their wait list and try to select similar students. So colleges are creating longer wait lists just to sort of hedge their bets. Yeah, and just, just to say, yeah, just to echo the ED stuff, ED used to be a bit of a, oh, just apply ED to one school. Now it's kind of, you go all in on ED because your chances of getting in ED are a little bit better. And it also fulfills the university's um, institutional requirement of every student they accept ED is probably going to then enroll at the university and that increases something which call, it's called the yield percentage that gets cycled back on rankings. Um, so it's all just, you know, it, it just moves the game up even earlier. Some schools like, is what's Yale doing now, Trevor? Is Yale still EA? I yeah, can't they're, they're restrictive early action. So read the fine print and, and don't think you're gonna fool anyone. I hear some kids, oh, I'm just apply to all eight Ivy League schools ED. You know what? You won't get into any of them. Um, so, so read the fine print and don't think you can pull one over on these schools because they they they're smarter than you are and they've seen everything before. But certainly to talk to your university advisor about about ED EA uh, decisions because um, some are binding, some are not. Okay. On to Canada. Here we go. Okay, as a Canadian, I can speak a little bit to, to Canada as well. Um, I have been overseas for 20 years, but I've really kept my foot in Canadian university admissions as well. And much like the US, um, we've seen an increase in the number of applications to Canada. Um, again, as more international students seek education abroad, but also one thing that we're seeing in the last um, couple of schools, it's more and more families considering Canada for you know, compared to the U.S. for political reasons or financial reasons or potential immigration re reasons. Um, it's much, e much easier to stay in Canada after graduating um, than it is at, at a U.S. institution. You know, the big, the big Canadian universities are the most well-known internationally. There's a lot of great institutions that students should consider. Um, but like the U.S., our students tend to focus on the big universities in the big cities like McGill, U of T, and UBC. Um, we're starting to see a little bit more of a shift to kind of US style admissions where some universities are asking students to do writing pieces. It's still in the minority, but some schools like UBC, for example, have moved in that direction. Um, a couple other great K universities listed there that sometimes international students don't think of. I personally love Waterloo. It used to be, and maybe still is, the number one place where all the Silicon Valley um, tech giants went to recruit. Um, they also have a great co-op program, so employers love that. Really, really popular school for STEM programs. Um, the other thing we're seeing, I think I would say in Canada with some schools like University of Toronto, kind of for the first time ever, is we've seen some many international students actually get pretty substantial scholarships for twenty or thirty thousand dollars per year, renewable for all four years, and that's something that I really didn't see before coming out of most Canadian universities. Um, you know, there was smaller scholarships, but those large amounts typically 
um, weren't very um, popular or, or prevalent. Okay, yeah, I, I, Canada has always been a great option. Um, the, the, the sort of the general take with Canadian universities, Trevor, maybe you can clarify this, maybe easier to get into on the main than American schools, but harder once you get there. Is that that's still kind of the broad, broad advice? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I think in Canadian spirit, they kind of are nice and feel like everyone deserves a chance, um, but they kind of, it's more of a filtering sort of process after the first year. Um, whereas U.S. universities spend a lot of money recruiting every every student, so they really want to keep the students once they're there. Yeah, and and, and once you're there, let me just to speak from a little bit of experience. It's it's very difficult to fail out of an elite American university. You have to try hard. I have friends who did. <laughs> okay, okay, try. I'll leave it to give you a little talk about TS. Okay, so as Jerry mentioned earlier, as long as uh, as well as working in a couple of international schools. I'm currently at ISM in the Philippines. In 2009, we started a company bringing international school students to visit colleges, at first in the US, and then we expand to Canada and the UK. And we started with our pre-scheduled summer tours. So these were set tour dates, set colleges, and students from countries and international schools around the world would join. Since then, we still do that, but then we they started doing a lot more custom tours for schools, organizations, and families. So if a school or a family or a family said we want to visit these colleges during these dates, that's something else that we do a lot of these days. And finally, we do a lot of consulting services now, especially during COVID, for schools on a whole variety of matters related to US, UK, um, Canadian, and European college admissions. We can go next, Jeremy. So you know, even before, I mean, I said, really, we started this company. I started this company because I really had students come back and talk about how beneficial visiting colleges was in terms of helping them make the decision. In fact, the research says that visiting is the most influential factor in terms of where students apply and attend than anything else. So more influential than counselors and peers and parents. Um, I think if families are going to be spending upwards of 250,000 US dollars for four years for their child's education, um, they should make sure that their kid makes a good decision. So investing the time to go visit colleges is a is very, very worthwhile. I've had a number of students I've done it with their families, which is a really good option. I think doing it with a group of other students with experienced tour leaders um, is really, really, really unique and offers something special, along with, you know, them having the opportunity to establish friendships and get to know other international school students. They get, they also get a lot of college advice along the way, because all the tour leaders are current counselors at different international schools around the world. So they get a lot of sort of included or free services that I know a lot of families pay for when they hire an outside private consultant. Again, nothing like visiting a campus or just seeing the school in action, walking around. It is really amazing to see students when they visit a campus. Um, and within usually a few minutes, they get a sense of whether they can picture themselves there or not. The other thing, whether it's through visiting on tours or through contacting college reps or going to college fairs, some colleges, but not all, are interested in what they call demonstrated interest. So in considering a student's application, they also consider, has the student engaged with us in some way? Have they been to their, our campus? Have they been to our college fairs? Have they been in contact by email? Um, and you know, a lot of colleges are using a lot of sort of data analytics now. When students get an email from a college, which the college basically buys their name from the college board, but when they get that email, universities, some universities are tracking whether the student opens that, whether they click on it, which pages they go to, how much time they spend on each page, page. So there's a lot of data going into kind of making admissions decisions now. And finally, as I sort of mentioned, visiting campuses really help students make informed decisions. Um, you know, I think to really properly research a school um, might take up to sort of 20 hours online, but visiting is a really efficient way to get a sense of what the school's like in person. 
Okay. Uh, over to me, I guess. SAT reasoning test. Again, next Wednesday, I'll be doing a deep dive and building up right now about the SAT, about the upcoming digital test. Some questions are coming in now. Is this answering about it? I'll be answering all those in some, some detail next week. I'm going to get pretty granular on it. Um, basically, it's the one test American kids used to take when they were finishing up high school. American high schools have different systems. They're international have different systems. And it used to be one of the biggest tests taken in the world. It covers reading, writing, and mathematics, writing being grammar. And kids that do really, really well academically do really, really well in the SAT. Um, there's a big correlation between the two. It's an important factor in admissions, as Trevor alluded to earlier. You want to be a little bit um, strategic about whether or not you submit scores or don't submit scores. I'll talk a little, I'll get into that a little bit today and much more next week. Um, scores don't have any set validity. The last paper and pencil test is just about six weeks away, and on, on two, two months away, rather, on December 3rd. And then as of March of next year, so they tell us, um, internationally, we'll be shifting to a digital SAT moving forward. Again, so they tell us because College Board's a little bit behind on releasing information that they promised us back in the summer. Um, changes to test policy. Uh, Trevor already talked about test optional. That was driven by the mere fact that a lot of kids in Ohio and California couldn't take the SAT. This wasn't a widespread rejection of the SAT by universities, but it led to that net effect that the SAT became something you couldn't take in many locations, and you can't require tests that students can't take. It's that simple. Now, that said, every university is also activities optional. So, so you know, it's a question of whether or not you want to submit based on where you fall, given the university that you're applying to. For non-competitive universities, you don't need it. You don't need it at all. But it's, it's a question of doing the research and finding out what the universities are looking for. Other metrics are more highly weighted. Um, particularly your GPA, which is your grade point average, the sum total of all the grades um, that, that you've gotten in school. And technically not submitting an SAT score is not supposed to hurt you at all in the applications game, but, but not submitting that puts a, a little bit more weight on all the other factors that go into the, into the application. So talk to your university advisor. It's very confusing. It was confusing to start with. I've been in this game for almost 30 years now. It was confusing to start with about when to take it, you know, how many times, what to report. Now it's become even more so. Every student's in a slightly situ different situation. So I encourage you to talk to university advisors, seek out professional help, just to make sure that you're not chasing something or doing something that you don't really need to do. Because ultimately, it's, it's not the most important thing. You and your grades and who you are get you into universities, not an SAT score. Use of SAT scores, um, again, they're an indicator they give you a rough guesstimate of where you stand with other people. Now, we have some data from the 20, 2020, 21. I'm still not seeing anything from the year after. And this is a rough metric of admit rate without scores, of students who get it without scores, admit rate with scores. You look at schools like Colgate, Emory, awesome schools, the admit rate with scores is double. But of course, this is a bit illusory because there's a confirmation bias, selection bias rather, that if you're applying to Emory and you're a complete rock star academically, then you're probably going to do really well in the SAT and you're probably going to submit your SAT scores and you're probably going to have a very good chance of getting in relative to the kid who probably doesn't have much of a chance just having a little bit of a shout and isn't submitting SAT scores. So, so take this data with a little bit of salt because it's, it's cherry picked to a certain extent and it doesn't reflect the full picture of the students that we're talking about here. Certainly on average, chance of getting in are a little bit better with SAT scores, but it's not going to determine everything. Um, again, more on testing. I can talk about this all night. I won't now, but next Wednesday, I'll be doing a deep dive with one of my other friends to talk about SCTs, and that registration information will be coming to you via email tomorrow or the next day if you want to participate in that webinar as well. The big thing is digital SAT. What is it? Where is it? When is it? And what to do about it? And then maybe the ACT. We swing back that direction internationally. Um, ACT is also taken on a computer, but it's different the way it's delivered than the SAT will be. So everything's just sort of in a state of flux right now. So the best thing really for current 11th graders, if you're not testing in December, just kind of wait, work in school, do some other things, and, and see what's going on next year before you make any calls from there. Um, and next, next week, I'll also be talking broadly about what we're seeing happen with A-levels and IB exams, which is kind of a return to normal more than anything uh, shocking, like going to computer delivered or anything along those lines. So Trevor, anything, any thoughts on testing?
No thoughts from Trevor? You're muted. Sorry, sorry my, I was muted. No, I said that was spot on. Nothing to add. Okay, excellent. So again, the, the digital SAT, something to best avoid it if you can. It's like, do you want to be the first person on the new roller coaster? No, I'll go the second week it's open. Thank you very much. So, so it's similar. I, I College Board hasn't covered itself with glory when they had to do some digital stuff with the AP. Um, big challenges. And the challenges are more easily addressed if you're in Santa Barbara, California, a nice big high school, than if you're at some big junior college in Singapore administering the test for a thousand kids with Wi-Fi that doesn't work very well. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they how they pull that off. Okay. So recommendations by year. Maybe I'll turn this back over to you, Trevor, to talk about what to do, junior, senior, et cetera, all the way through. Okay, yeah, sure. So for this year's graduating class, um, as you probably know, December is the last chance to take the paper SAT. Um, I think most grade 12 students by now or students graduating this year should be finished or close to finish their, their testing. For next year's graduating class, class of 2024, it's really important for students to focus on academics, of course, you know, thinking about test prep and, and the SAT, but also the other side of kind of their growth and what they're contributing to their school community. There's, you know, reading um, has lots of benefits, including, I think Jeremy would say that strong readers tend to score highly on the reading and writing section of the SAT. Um, students should consider taking the December um, SAT this year um, and then potentially or, or potentially next spring. Typically, students will take the SAT once in their junior year and then once in their, their senior year. And for the later graduating classes, I would say don't stress, you know, focus on doing well in school, get involved, playing sports, going to clubs, whatever their interests are. Um, and as parents, I would encourage parents not to sort of push their kid in a direction that, that they want, but to encourage their, their student to find kind of their passion and really invest heavily in it. U.S. universities want students heavily involved. But that does not mean 10 different activities. It means doing three or four things really, really well and investing heavily in them. So it's really about quality rather than quantity. Jeremy? Yeah, the one thing just to echo, um, I've been doing this a long time and I'm seeing kids with COVID um, coming back from that, that experience. Math skills have deteriorated, but your kids honestly are not going to do Khan Academy for fun on weekends. The one thing I can say to just recommend, hector them, force them, read more, read more articles, National Geographic, Sports Illustrated, anything with more than a couple hundred words in the printed form that's not on TikTok is better than probably what they're reading now. Um, we're seeing the new SAT actually reading is changing a fair amount. It's going to test a different kind of style of reading, but the reading skills are definitely deteriorating most notably for the kids that I'm seeing year on year in that you, you give them a 400 word article to read and they, they just, their eyes glaze over because um, it's just not a core skill that they, not, it's something you learn how to do. You learn how to read better by reading. Um, and that's the most broad advice I can give. Yeah, okay, so onwards. Okay, uh, Test Area Singapore, this is my quick pitch. Um, we do an SAT prep. I started doing it as undergrad in university in New York City. I kind of did a number of things, I ended up here 21 years ago coming up just past 21 years, uh, doing something completely different. And we've been doing that here ever since. We work with many of the international schools in Singapore directly. Email us if you have questions, if you work with your school, either past or present. Um, all our graduates, all our teachers are graduate top American universities, although that doesn't make a great teacher. You need to be a great teacher as well. We have programs for younger kids doing core reading and grammar skills. Your, you think your kids can't read, their grammar is terrible, trust me. Um, so it's something you need to work on as well. Numerous test prep programs we are running in Singapore for the December test. We'll have a full suite of programs into next year once we figure out the whole digital test. But we show if we have all sorted by October with SAT and ACT prep if you want to go that route. And then we also have Zoom programs available for kids outside of Singapore, both within Asia and without. So check that information on our website. Also some tutoring for the uh, SSAT and ISCE which are the kids, which are the tests you take to get into American prep schools, which are becoming more popular now, um, which we haven't even discussed, but we won't need to. And again, just cross over by 
by uh, feeling for stones. It may be that your dream university might not, you know, may not gonna get in. Um, I heard at a recent event at a school, a particular uh, British university was very honest with students and a lot of them just ended up crying because they thought they had a good shot at getting in and this university told them, no, sorry, you're not gonna get in. That's okay, life goes on. There are other universities that are gonna be wonderful. So broaden your perspectives outside your normal top 10, top 20, top anything. And particularly if you're looking for something kind of plain vanilla in terms of majors of see economics, psychology, look at where you wanna live, which country you wanna live in and have that be the first determinant. And then look at universities in that region or in that city or in that area, rather than obsessing about a brand. Um, any bag is good, even if you can't afford or get an LV bag, they all do fundamentally the same thing. So anyway, that's my own little rant, I'll go on. Relax, don't stress out too much about all this. Everything's going to come together in the, in the end. If you go to a good international school, you have all the support necessary for you. Just kind of adapt and get a little bit Dallas with it. Just go with it. And, and just, just you, it's going to be fine no matter where you end up. Talk to university counselor, talk to family, talk to friends. Anything online, be very suspect, except webinars coming from us. <laughs> okay. So any, any final sage words, uh, Trevor, from your side? No, thanks, Jeremy. That was excellent. Okay, I just look at see some some questions about yeah just uh, Maho. This these are questions that are kind of specific to you, and you're going to want to have a chance to talk with a university advisor about things like that. Um, even if you're not a world champion or national level basketball player or something like that, just the mere fact that you do that activity is useful to show that you have interests outside of the normal classroom things. Of course, if you are an Olympic caliber athlete, that's a different different category, but universities, maybe Trevor, you just comment on what universities are looking for in terms of clubs and participation, rather than being, you know, going to the Olympics or world championships in a particular sport. Right. Yeah. So colleges are looking at really sort of depth of commitment over time. How many hours per week are you like really invested in this and in, in this activity? Um, and the second thing is, have you made a difference and, and making a difference is different than sort of getting, you know, award. It's really how have you helped grow this organization, make it more popular, um, increase enrollment or, or club membership, um, increase, you know, fundraising, all those types of things. So they understand there's very few students in the world who are sort of national level of anything, whether it's athletes or, you know, debaters or whatever, but they're looking for students who are really committed to their activity because they know that if students are committed to things in high school they're likely to find similar or even different passions that they'll be committed to in university. And U.S. college sort of universities want um, that residential sort of ex experience. You know, the, the learning at U.S. institutions extends far beyond the classroom, and they really want a community of learners who are passionate with different things. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, I remember our, our old friend Dale Ford used to talk about, it's like, it's not a stew, it's a salad. So universities are looking to choose a lot of different things to put them together to make the right mix of students. And if it's the year that they already have 15 really, really start smart STEM kids who also play violin, they might be, they're, they're tapped out that year. But if, if, you, if you do something else, that, that might make a difference. Uh, that's oversimplifying things. But um, certainly fo follow your passion as long as it's not computer games. Um, just find other things that are inter interest you. And then also the other thing I will say is a lot of kids want to get into the best possible university they can get into, which is great. Definitely that's something to aspire to. You also want to go to a university that's right for you. Um, do you want to be the, 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 at the sharp end of the stick or the low end of the stick in terms of how you compare with other students in your class? It, 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 advice I always give I played basketball to a mediocre level in high school. My senior year, they said, Jeremy, you've been with us four years. We'll put you on varsity, but you'll be the third string. Or you can play in the B team and you're going to be the captain. I said, I'd rather be the captain and play in the B team. I played every game and had a great season, had a great time. If, if, I, was, if I was on the, the bench, I would have done a lot. So if you take that sports metaphor, do you want to go to a school where you can fully embrace everything and not just have to work super, super hard to keep up? Um, so that... Mm -hmm. it, to each their own. And just to add to that, right, you know, I hear a lot of students and families talking about going to the best university. Well, not all universities are the best at everything. So I really encourage students and families to look at which universities are strong in different programs. 
Harvard's a great institution, but Harvard is not the best at everything. So it's really about what is the sort of intended sort of path or, or course. I think the other thing you mentioned, Jeremy, in terms of the salad, the other way that we used to frame it, because the, there's the myth out there that colleges want well-rounded students. Um, and I really believe that's a myth. They really want pointy students to, to create a well-rounded class. So a pointy student is a student has, who has really clear, really developed, really sort of vested interest um, and has made a really serious commitment to them. There's the well-rounded idea. Um, colleges know it's pretty rare to find a student who's super strong at MUN, who spends 10 hours a week doing service week, who's on three varsity sports teams, who's student council president. Those people, you know, really don't exist. And they want students with really sort of clear passions and all these different people with different passions coming together to create a well-rounded um, incoming class. Yeah, they're, 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 they're sculpting it. They have their own priorities about what they're gonna do. So one other bit of advice I've just picked up over the years, if you're interested in something niche, say, you know, Roman history or even something more, more broad like psychology, find books that in that subject that interest you or find articles in that subject in magazines or newspapers that interest you. Find out who wrote those articles and then Google search their name and find out where the authors went to university at the undergraduate level. Or if it's an academic book or anything like that, find out where the authors of that book teach at a university and that university probably is going to be strong in that particular niche or that particular area because all the rankings that come out it's it's they're terrible in terms of having a you know how do you rank harvard versus mit they're chalk and cheese they're very different so and, and doing subject specific rankings for undergraduate is almost it's, it's a fool's errand but finding information on stuff that's been written that interests you then backtracking find out where those people went to school it might surprise you that certain schools you've never heard of or never be on your radar are renowned at one particular field, which is your core interest that you might not discover otherwise. Okay, so now any other questions, you can just pop them in the chat. We got through that in pretty good time. Okay, about 48 minutes, not bad. Um, and then our email addresses are respectively up here. Did I spell inquiries right, Trevor? <laughs> just doesn't look Yes. Good. I did, okay, great. Um, my English, no, my English is pretty good. I just, I, I, I'm just old enough to have spell check. Um, too old. So we wish you all, all the best in your university uh, kind of uh, journey. It is a journey every step of the way. Be sure to enjoy yourself as much as you can along the way. There are so many great schools out there that, that we haven't heard of. Um, they would be wonderful for you. And um, certainly wish you all the best in the future. I'll see some of you back here next Wednesday. So any any. A closing benediction? No, thank, thank you, everyone. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. And if you have questions about college tours um, for your son or daughter, as a family, as a group, please shoot me an email at the email address on the screen. Okay, great. So thank you all. Have a lovely evening and uh, all the best. <laughs>